everybody doing? Are we all excited to be here tonight? So nice, so nice to see so many beautiful faces and to be here with this incredible, incredible panel. And we are going to go on a journey tonight. So I want to say how excited I am to be here and uh, representing PIX11, which is a local station, a New York station, what it is to be New York. I can see all the CBS viewers getting upset at me right now. Um, I wanted to say that I want to thank the Conservancy for uh, allowing me this great, great opportunity to be with you tonight. I'm also excited to be with the First Lady once again. Uh, your graciousness meeting you now several times, has it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight to explain what it is to be an Im immigrant through my eyes uh, and my journey on television as well. Um, of course, Tani, it is so beautiful meeting you. Tani Nandini Islam, our author right here. How beautiful is she? <laughs> and James, who will be moderating everything tonight for us, so give it up for James right there. I wanted to say, like, the immigrant experience is something that connects all of us in some way, and we all know that as we look upon our aunts, uncles, grandfathers, great-grandfathers. Uh, it all connects us and it all binds us. But the beauty is that what it is to be an immigrant is also what it is to really truly be a New Yorker. And for me, that is the beauty and the diversity of our great city of ours that, that we represent. Uh, but sometimes, you know, being a New Yorker, uh, and being an immigrant, it creates obstacles in truly understanding cultures, in truly understanding religion, in truly understanding what it is to be a part of the fabric of the coat that we wear as New Yorkers. Sometimes we wear armor, but we're going to put it on as a soft, delicate coat with beautiful fabric and fiber, and we're going to feel every bit of it tonight. Um, sometimes the boundaries may blind us, but I really hope that tonight we demolish those boundaries and sometimes those boundaries blind us, but I hope tonight we will ultimately see that even though we might be distant neighbors who travel the same route on the subways and the buses and walk the streets of New York, we are ultimately part of one struggle, our struggle, and that struggle is to really be a New Yorker. I was told uh, by the First Lady to talk about you know, my first memories of immigrating here to the country, and I'm South Asian. My family is from Chennai, India. And I came here for the first time when I was five years old. And it wasn't, you know, I see Ellis Island because I grew up on Staten Island. But for me, <laughs> JFK was truly the gateway. Um, so, you know, this was 1970s New York. Let's go way back, everybody. Think about it. Think about 1970s New York. It was, it was a very interesting time to come to this country. And my father came here in search of, like, so many an opportunity, a better understanding, an opportunity for his family that he couldn't necessarily provide in India. And he left all of us there to come here with my mother. And I know that was a tough decision because I was just, I was just born, really. And my brothers and I stayed back with my grandmother. But I remember walking through JFK Airport very vividly. And back then, there was a big customs hall, and there was a big gateway and a walkway where your parents would stand there as you walked through customs. And I remember at that time, I was two years old, I did not have memory of my mo mother, really, or her face, just pictures and cassette tapes where she would talk to me and my aunt and uncle would play it for me at night. And I remember seeing my mother on the gateway, and I was on the hip of my grandmother as she was wearing her red sari, it was a red-purple sari, her gray hair, and my grandmother was my mother up until, up until that point. And I looked at her, and I saw my father nervously looking at his children on the gateway, my mother crying, them waving frantically at us, saying, it's us, we're here, this is your new home. And I remember being scared, and I remember looking at my grandmother for a reassuring look and a hug, and she whispered and told me in our language in Tamil, it's all going to be okay. And it truly was. It all was okay. Because ultimately, even though I was different moving to Staten, you know, well, first Brooklyn, then to Staten Island, <laughs> the bumps and bruises along the way were all worth it. It was part of my experience. It was part of what it is to define me. But it's that definition of self that I think, Tani, really explores 
she really talks about it in such a passionate way, and her characters are so identifiable for me. While my grandmother and my parents were that defining moment, that code of comfort that I wear every day to this day when I question myself and my identity and who I am and how I have to describe the name Sukanya Krishnan. Who are you? What are you? Where are you from to this day? I get that question. I put on that coat and I know where my identity comes from and I know who I am and I stand on that hip of my grandmother who whispered in my ear, everything is going to be okay. So let's open the chapter today and let's get on this journey together and let's read and break down barriers. Let's redefine and define what it is to be a New Yorker as we are sitting in the people's house today. So are you ready? Yeah. All right. So should we bring the first lady out? <laughs> Knowledge is power and words are power and she used the words all the time to describe herself. She discovered poetry in high school. She used her love and talent for writing to communicate with both herself and the outside world. At Wellesley College, she teamed up with fellow students to launch Brown Sisters. It was a publication celebrating the voice of women of color. After graduating, she completed the prestigious Radcliffe Publishing course. Her first job out of the college was at Red Book Magazine and she spent the first decade in magazine publishing working as a writer, an editor, and marketing research analyst. Her love of words led her to a role of speech writing for Mayor David Dinkins, which is where she met and fell in love with our mayor, Bill de Blasio. <laughs> I had to mention him. Where is he? <laughs> and now as First Lady of New York City, she's using her platform to communicate on behalf of our most vulnerable New Yorkers, giving voices to the voiceless. That includes chairing the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, which aims to ensure all New Yorkers have access to programs and resources they need to achieve their full potential. It includes Thrive NYC, which I know you all know about, and if you don't, look it up. It's an effort to bring forth mental health issues to the forefront here in the New York City. And it also includes leading the Gracie Book Club and the many other programs here at Gracie Mansion. It is my pleasure in the people's house to announce to you and everybody who's watching today, um, the First Lady of New York City, Ms. Shirley McRae. <laughs> Thank you, Suki. That was so beautiful. I'm so glad you're here. Um, it's such an honor to have such a respected journalist. You're quite skilled. And, and I thank you for sharing your, that personal story with us. It was so, I, I mean, I just want to, I want you to keep on talking. <laughs> have you written the book yet? <laughs> you, you really do. You really do. It's like, I, uh, I, I want to know more. So thank you for that. Um, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts about Bright Lines. I, I have to recognize four New Yorkers who played such an important role in making the book club possible today. Tony Marks, president of the New York Public Library. Where are you? Please stand up so everyone can applaud you. Okay. Lisa Rosenblum, chief librarian at the Public Library. Where are you? Mary Bleiberg, Vice President for Programs and Services at the Queens Public Library. And also Patrick Nolan, Editor-in-Chief at Penguin Books. Thank you all, thank everyone, right? We thank you for everything that you're doing to make, make sure New York City remains the literary capital of the world. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone who's taking part in today's conversation. Whether you are here at Gracie Mansion, or tuning in from your local library, your smartphone, or your home computer. If you can hear me talking, then you are part of this book club. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're thrilled to have you. Gracie has long been the people's house. And from the very beginning, Bill and I wanted to build on that legacy and make this a place where New Yorkers can celebrate our common history and our shared passions. And New Yorkers are certainly passionate about books. This New Yorker is passionate about books. <laughs> like many of you, as soon as I learned to read, I could never have enough books in my life. 
I was that kid who wanted to go to the library and would come home with as many books as my little arms would carry. And reading is still my favorite form of relaxation and discovery. With books, I can explore both myself and the wider world, and sometimes within the same sentence. The theme we chose, Envisioning Distant Neighbors, taps right into the power of story and literature's unique ability to connect us with one another. If there's one thing New Yorkers know about, it's neighbors. After all, we've got 8.4 million of them. Sometimes these neighbors seem very distant, even when we're sharing a subway pole. They wear different clothes, they eat different foods, they speak different languages, they may worship differently. But when you get down to what really matters, we're all human, we're all New Yorkers, and we're all neighbors. And our lives and our city are so much richer when we share stories with one another, with as much honesty as we can muster and with humor. That is exactly what Tani has done so brilliantly with, bril with Bright Lines. Now, there is so much I could say about this book, but I am far more eager to hear what all of you think. So it is now my great pleasure to turn the conversation over to our moderator, James Hanahan. And I'm gonna say just a few words about him. <laughs> James is one of those remarkable people whose creativity knows no limits. His short stories have been published in One Story, Open City, and The Literary Review. His criticism and profiles have appeared in The Village Voice, Spin, The New York Times Magazine, and many other outlets. He has published two novels, God Says No and Delicious Foods, which is one of the best books I've read this year. I highly recommend it. So James is an extraordinary writer, and he's, he's also a really nice guy. <laughs> You know, as, as thoughtful with his actions as he is with his words. And I thank you, James, for making today possible. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you so much for that warm uh, introduction. Um, it's, uh, I'm overcome. I'm verklempt. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so I, I thought that since Bright Lines is such a wonderful book to, to, <laughs> to read and listen to, that <laughs> we might start out this uh, conversation um, by having Tani read a little bit from the book. <laughs> okay. Since we have the, the opportunity, you're here. It's I'm not here. a book club where the author is absent and people trash the book. <laughs> yeah, they get trashed and trashed the book. <laughs> um, no, we're going to be very civil here. I'm going to read a little bit of Bright Lines, and I'm going to start at the beginning. Um, so close your eyes, get in the zone, look at the words as I'm reading, um, and yeah, we're going to start talking after that. So thank you so much for being here. I'm very verklempt. Uh, thank you to the First Lady, James and Sukanya for being up here with me as well. It's an incredible honor. And as a New Yorker, it is absolutely surreal mm -hmm. to think of people reading your words. Um, can't believe it. So I am very grateful to all of you here. You're going to make me cry, so I'm not going to do that now. All right. Girls everywhere. Anwar Salim stared brazenly at the flock that strode down Atlantic Avenue. He wondered if they noticed him sucking in his paunch as he stroked the last ribbon of lavender paint across the awning of his apothecary. Loteria y cigarrillos y se habla espanol disappeared into the settling twilight, erasing the last traces of the previous owner's bodega. Anwar wiped his brow. A last, the last band of paint stiffened on his forehead. He climbed down, lightheaded from the fumes. On that Saturday of June, everything in Brooklyn, everything except the sun, seemed to rise. Around the corner on 3rd Avenue, petrol vapors blazed from cars in standstill, and traffic shimmered as if recalled in a dream. Trails of a street hawker's incense disappeared into the scaffolding of an art deco phallus where pigeons clamored in its eaves. Anwar's apothecary, sober and secular, nestled between ye old liquor shop and a holy bookstore. A shout from the apartment upstairs startled Anwar enough that he nearly lost his balance. 
That's not bad for business now, is it, Anwar? Called out gu the Guyanese street hawker, Rashad Prasad, from his table down the block. I've got a very good feeling about this color, my friend. Nah, man, the fire escape. A girl on the move. Rashad laughed and pointed to a young girl climbing out of the window above the apothecary. The girl hopped down the fire escape, her rump facing the street. Anwar craned his neck to see. She peeled off her hijab, revealing hair cropped as short as Audrey Hepburn's. Mad dash toward the train, the girl did not look back. A fantasy sobered him. Charu, the runaway, slinking outside with her singing hips, those taunting coal-painted eyes ready to meet internet confidants. He shook this image of his younger daughter from his mind. They'd been having some trouble lately. She was moody, but she was going to NYU. That counted for something, right? Anwar looked once more to admire his brand new storefront. The color was feminine, but this last bit of paint could liven up their bathroom walls, which had become tinged gray with neglect. His wife, Hashi, would disapprove. She hated pink dink, as she told him every time he wore his beloved polo shirt. She rhymed her displeasure, skinny dinny, Spanish tanish, sex tex, and they always began with the letter T. Rashad helped Anwar pull down the heavy, screeching gate. Need some grease, said Anwar. Try this. Rashad smacked a high five, pressing a Ziploc bag into his palm. Trail mix? Majun. Dates, raisins, walnuts, hash, and honey. Thank you, said Anwar, shaking Rashad's hand goodbye. It was curious how they'd known each other for almost 10 years, but how little he knew about his friend. Rashad had been hawking since he was 18 after some problems at home with his mother, but that was as much as Anwar knew. He handed him a New York Post from his back pocket. And you take this. I've got to quit reading this shit. Gives me nightmares about freak accidents and Mets games. As Anwar made his way home, he nibbled on the majun. Sweetness coated his tongue. He unbuttoned one more button of his cotton plaid shirt to let the evening breeze in. He surrendered to the humdrum of dusk and listened as the voices, wares, wisdoms, and gods changed. Coraline tendrils of cloud revealed a gaping hole where the sun had been. As he walked down Hanson Place and crossed over <laughs> to Fulton Street, eateries changed names as frequently as bandits. Further down on Fulton, he passed a mosque with all the exterior charm of its neighbors, a 99 cent store and a bodega. Anwar never ventured there and strode past the hennaed beards. He did not believe in the gods of these men. Years past mingled with the unknowns of tomorrow on these evening walks home. He had lived atrocity during the 1971 war in Bangladesh, questioned the Supreme for allowing it. 32 years later, and still the ugliness of the war stayed with him, a dull ache for the most part. The life he managed to have unnerved him, Hashi, Charu, and of course his elder daughter, Ella, who could not be called beautiful, but was on the inside. He pictured the perfect end to his day, a cold shower, then sitting in his studio, penning the memoir he could never start about a pair of vagabonds during the war. As he left turned onto Cambridge Place, a maze of dominoes collapsed, each tick synchronized with the blinking eyes of the hustlers who ruled this corner. They nodded at him, and he nodded back. There was nothing like this, the brownstone streets of his neighborhood. Children ran through an unleashed fire hydrant, hopscotch chalk erased in the wasteful gush of water. The aroma of grilled burgers brought tears to his eyes. He missed red meat. As Anwar walked up to his brownstone on the corner of Cambridge, and Cambridge Place and Gates Avenue, a hibiscus blossom landed by his feet. He had believed the tree would induce restful sleep in Ella, who struggled with insomnia. Within a year, it was already five feet tall. Now, after 10 years, it was taller than the house. Ella had slept peacefully, he believed, ever since. It's good to be high, he thought running his tongue on his teeth for the remnants of the majun. I'll stop there when he's high. <laughs> and uh, you can read the rest. <laughs> great. A great father. <laughs> Very chill. Um, I have to admit that one of the things that struck me immediately when I started reading Bright Lines was that it took place in my neighborhood, literally. She mentions in that, <laughs> in that passage, she mentions the street I live on. Don't stalk me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, was like, I looked at him like... But that was why she looked up at me when, at that moment. Um, and yet it was about a community that I had very little awareness was living right around me. And so I was like, 
riveted immediately. Um, now, since I have you here, <laughs> this, is, this is a book that makes you, or it made me very curious about the author. Um, and you know, the stereotype of first novels is that, you know, somebody has written essentially a, a memoir, a, a sort of thinly veiled memoir. Um, so my first question to you is, what do you have in common with the characters in Bright Lines, and in what ways does your story differ from theirs? Love the question. Uh, <laughs> so for me, all of the characters, there's three point of views. Uh, there's Anwar, there's Ella, and there's Charu. And they each are very special to me, but they share different parts of my personality. I think that's very true to say. So outwardly, Charu is very you know, obsessed with her identity, her sexuality, her femininity, her fashion. Um, she's very bold, she takes risks. Um, that is all true, that's how I was in high school. I was ready to be out of my parents' grip to do life, I was ready for life. Uh, but Ella has this love of nature and this quietude that I think I really nurtured um, being a nerd. I mean, I think all writers are kind of major nerds. And Ella's that side of me. <laughs> it's like, speak me? for You're yourself. Me? <laughs> 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 You're very cool, James. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Ella kind of represents the more, um, the side of me that yearns to find metaphors in nature, that yearns to find quietude, that yearns to find myself. And Anwar, the father, actually I feel very close to. He was the first character that I came up with. And he's really just that person who is always looking at the past to kind of inform his future, who's kind of doing the right thing, but not so great all the time. He's kind of always doing the wrong thing, but it comes out okay. And I feel like I'm that person that's like always messing up, but I'm getting forgiven and trying to redeem myself. So I think they all share that with me. In terms of geography, where I'm from, you know, I grew up all over the South, the Midwest. My sister and I were born in different states, but we came to New York in the early 90s. And Brooklyn and Queens and the city was always me as an outsider wanting to be in that and covet that. So when I moved to Brooklyn in 2004. What neighborhood? Uh, Clinton Hill. <laughs> yes. Um, Represent. I lived on, you know, St. James and Lafayette, and I lived on Downing Street, where the block party that Dave Chappelle threw was mm -hmm. filmed on. And I was in completely enthralled by the verve and the life of this neighborhood. And we are living in a changing city, so even 10 years ago where this book takes place is very different from the city that we're living in now. So in a lot of ways, it's a time capsule and a love letter to that period where I discovered Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, just in the last week, like five high-rise buildings have gone up. <laughs> yeah, and, and seriously. Uh, yeah, and they're all, I, think, I think Russian oligarchs are all yeah. the, the purchasers. This town. The purchasers that. Um, but, um, so you were, you were already talking a little bit about story. What is your family's history with um, the uh, liberation, the Bangladeshi Rivia, nah, <laughs> the Bangladesh Liberation War? So uh, for most people of their generation, they lived through the war. So they were there during the war. Um, my mom was a teenager. My dad was in his early 20s. And for people that lived there at that time, what it meant was after um, the University of Dhaka was you know, pretty much destroyed and people were murdered, people moved outside of the city. It was no longer considered safe. So they would go to a village home, family home, and they grew up with this kind of sense of pending doom and fear. But at the heart of that was, we want to be Bangladesh. And that has been transmitted to me through storytelling as I grew up. But I think in a lot of ways, they prevented us from, us meaning my sister and I, who's here with me tonight, uh, they prevented us from really knowing um, all the gory details, which have come out slowly over the last, you know, 30 years. So I think for them, when they moved to the States, along with so many other immigrants from South Asia, it was really a chance for them to start a new life um, after this horrific war where millions of their countrymen were murdered. My dad was not a soldier in the war, but he has friends that were. Um, and they all have their own intimate kind of relationship to this horrific you know, moment in their, in their history, um, which make their way into the book. So, you know, an example of one of the scenes that has some truth or resonance to the, you know, stories my mom has said is 
you know, the Pakistani army saw a photo of a Pakistani actress in her notebook and, you know, they liked that she had this actress from their country, mm -hmm. um, which made them kind of leave her alone and not mess with her on a train, you know, because they're like, yeah. we're not going to mess with you because you've got one of our actresses. So these little human moments that for a 13-year-old girl would just completely, you know, I could die right now. That's what I'm thinking of my yeah. mom being a teenager, but she survived and she's here and she came here and, and had a family. And she's still a fan of the actress? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I'm going to ask her that. Yeah. <laughs> During her she's like ripping up the page. Like <laughs> <laughs> this like framed picture yeah. of her in the, in the living room. Um, you, you also, I mean, not to harp on the uh, address thing, but um, you're, you almost like, you know, Abel Ferrar, the filmmaker who makes a lot of films in New York. He, he ha he's one of the only filmmakers where if you, if you watch his films and you're from New York, you can tell that the locations are all consistent. Like if people are walking from one place to another, they, in the next scene, they won't be on like, you know, they won't move from like Soho to the Upper West Side, <laughs> right? Um, and I feel like you've got some of that going on too. Like there's a very specific address um, of the place, and I looked it up on Google. Um. So yeah, thank God for fact checkers at <laughs> Penguin. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm very attuned to this as like a map. So this book is a map, and you're not going to be on Atlantic Avenue and then find yourself, you know, on 86th Street or something in Bay Ridge or whatever. You're going to be in Hanson Place and then walking the right way. That was very intentional. Um, 111 Cambridge Place is a real place. My mind was blown. And I didn't even go look for it until after the book was like published as a galley. So that's like my, you know, this is my a work of my imagination. I'm very like committed to that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I saw it, it was an empty brownstone, which if any of you wants to buy it for me, I will, <laughs> I will gladly move in and take care of it for you. Um, but it, it's surreal because you see this building and it actually really looked like what I had envisioned. And anyone who's done any of the garden tours or walks in Brooklyn, I mean, you know that like people s love their homes and take care of their gardens. And I really wanted to evoke that kind of like Eden within this gritty city that we're living in. So to me, um, it is very, based in, very much based in realism, but that particular 111 Cambridge Place is not actually the corner that I said it was on because I needed it to be on a strategic corner. And so I, s I fudged that a little bit. But <laughs> um, what, what made you want to write a novel in the first place? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, that's the, the question yeah. every, every novelist asks themselves every day, right? Why, why this? Why now? I think that there's a sense of inevitability in all of our lives for whatever we find our purpose to be. And I think that's something that we're all figuring out, you know, so whatever your job is, you t kind of, you know, have a, a vision in mind for what you want to be. So when I first moved to the city, I was a community organizer. I worked at Make the Road New York. I worked with young people. Um, I was a young person. I did theater in campaigns that were protesting many different of, uh, injustices that these students faced in school. And, you know, I tried to produce plays off Broadway. And it was all this stuff that was, like, always coming back to telling this story of, you know, how the past collides with the present and, you know, can be understood in a creative way. That was always the thing and the core of it. So when I decided I was actually going to hunker down and write a novel, um, that happened to me when I was living in India. I wasn't even living in New York. I was doing a fellowship abroad in New Delhi. And I think being away from home really makes home just come alive. Um, and to me, it felt like this is a way I can buy time, tell the stories I want to tell, mm -hmm. and have something to do. So I applied to do my MFA at Brooklyn College, and it was a wrap. You know, once I started writing it in India, I tried to complete it, and it took mm -hmm. 10 years after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's funny how that yeah. distance is yeah. often important to, to um, telling the truth yeah. about your your past and your um, your background and specific people in your past sometimes. Absolutely, too, right? like just being across the globe mm -hmm. from your family, you start to think about them uh, with less editing. Yeah, of your of your own self. Um, 
So I was gonna I was gonna try to summarize the book on <laughs> some level, but I realized that it's not really it's not really possible because it's episodic more than more than anything else. A, a lot of things happen in the book, um, and you never feel as if the action is not going anywhere. But I wouldn't say that there's like a plot. But I mean, for me, plot means something very specific. Like it's like you know, a bunch of guys find a suitcase full of money, and you know, it's just like a contrived thing that feels fake. Um, I mean, I got very much the feeling as I was reading the book that like I was just with this family, not that. I knew where anything was, what was going to happen to them. I knew that things, like tensions were arising. Um, and, I th and I think you are, you know, I think that was completely intentional, obviously. Um, can you talk a little bit about your intentions? I think that's a great question. Because first of all, when you write a book, immediately after it's out, you're like, oh my god, this is what I would have done. Like, there, things come up. So I plot is something that I love in a book. But this book is really about the inner lives of these people and how they connect to people in their family and how one goes through revolutions within themselves. So, you know, Elle is a great example of a character who experiences that. Um, but it, it's really hard, I think, in fiction to find, you know, that the change of a person that they're going through, you know, through adolescence, middle age, I mean, these are the huge changes in life that people go through. It's really hard to find fiction, I think, that lets that be the centerpiece of the entire story, is like this coming of age that's happening to all the members of the family, um, until the family is eventually, you know, kind of dissolved in the form that we first meet them in. So, you know, how does tragedy, ki tragedy kind of shape the way that we connect to our family members? How does history play a part in that? How does our own, you know, journey in finding our gender and sexuality play a role in that? Those are all like larger themes I was dealing with. Um, and I realized that what would happen would be a much more subtle journey than one that would be like, where's the suitcase with the money and the dead guy <laughs> that, you right, know, on right. the bed, you know, <laughs> like that is awesome. I love reading books <laughs> like that. Um, but I think for a teenager or a young college kid who's not certain of who they are and where they're going, I mean, how many books do we have with young people of color who are struggling with their identity? Women. Uh, women. Uh, queer and trans people of color. I mean, we're not really talking about those stories in school as much as we hopefully are moving towards that. But that's there are more kind than of there used to be. More than there used to be, which I'm so grateful for and lucky to know writers that are doing that. But I think for me, that was fe that was that feeling of what's missing. What am I looking for? How am I trying to find a voice within what I don't see myself in? I mean, I've never really read of novel with the Bangladeshi female protagonist written by an American author in my life, <laughs> you know? Like, from Bangladesh, not India, not Pakistan, not Sri Lanka, but Bangladesh. I mean, I've never read that, and that's crazy. Like, imagine if you've never read a book by someone who looks like you or is like you. I, I haven't either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm that glad because I was like, that maybe was, that's not true, and that I'm missing like a major book. <laughs> right, a book. really famous yeah, yeah. author. Did you, like you know, oh, she doesn't know oh, <laughs> how how Bangladeshi is she. <laughs> but I, I'll admit, I, I haven't either, and that was one of the reasons that that was one of the things that attracted me to the book. I was, um, the characters in Bright Lines overturn a lot of stereotypes, um, the girls in particular, but also the parents. Um, what did you want to say specifically about those experiences? I honestly, this is where the imagination factor comes into play. And I think fiction is the author's imagination. It's not an autobiography, because if you were to write an autobiography, it would be way harder and more annoying, I think, to and do. And you'd alienate more of your family. Totally. Like, this is like this nice gap between me and my family, where it's like, oh, this isn't true, so this is OK that you're talking about this. Um, but you know, to me, it's really one of those things where there's this opportunity with fiction to chart the unknown. And for me, like a Bangladeshi father who's smoking pot and hanging out in the neighborhood and owns an apothecary and is really cool and like kind of bewildered more than he is like angry or strict, that just seemed like a great character that I wanted, I want him to exist. I want, I mean, in some ways, I think my dad has certain qualities of this dad, but he's way more conservative and strict than this dad, you know? <laughs> 
And then who doesn't want their mom to have a beauty parlor downstairs? I mean, like, I would love that. That would be great. Great eyebrows all the time. So these were, like, things that I was like, this would be awesome. Um, but there was this, like, threading salon on the corner of, like, Fort Greene Place and Fulton Street that was, like, an Indian lady, and you just get them done. It was open, like, two days out of the week. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of, like, what the inspiration was, that little kernel. But then I was like, wow, a garden apartment beauty salon. What a great way to create a hub, a connective um, space for all the people in the neighborhood to come. And that's where all the weaves come from, right? So you cut out the middleman. Hey, it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's just really, it's also, you know, when we talk about envisioning distant neighbors, I mean, maybe we're not actually talking to our, maybe it's not realistic for these people to come together. But at the same time, like, you and I could be having lunch at a coffee shop, you know, in the neighborhood. And it's like, yeah, we're doing the things that the characters in the books are doing. They just don't have the job of like writer, but they're owners of businesses and they're always intermingling, you know, with people in their community. So I really wanted to like create those spaces in the book where you would see different people interacting together. Yeah, I always find that that's what makes a character come alive for me is like the thing that, um, like a bit of self-awareness that you aren't ex expecting or like something that is is completely not opposite necessarily, but it's just not expected, but it still feels human. Um, and I mean, Anwar is, is, a, gr is a great character for, um, for that kind of thing. Um, there's also a sense in the book that the role of religion is changing in the characters' lives. Oh, the, actually, I was gonna ask you this other question, which is a little more basic, <laughs> um, based on one of your Facebook posts from this afternoon. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> doing what? his research. <laughs> Do you get a lot of comments about your last name? Oh my gosh, yes. This happened today. I will share with you all. Uh, so my last name is Islam, like the religion. Um, and it is the religion. <laughs> That's where it comes from. It means peace. It means peace. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, there was this moment where we talked about, can I use my pen name? Because I had started to use this pen name for a few articles. And it was literally like I would read a tarot card reading and be like, should I have a pen name or should I have a real name? And then I did like a Facebook poll. And it wasn't even like my really good friends were like, definitely use your real name. They were like, oh, 50-50. Like 50-50, like really good friends were like, do a pen name. <coughs> Islam's not going to be a good thing for your book. So the thing that really got to me was I have to be real. And like I have been carrying this name my entire life for 30 years. So uh, you're that yeah. old. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I am. I'm past 30 years, but I have been carrying this name. And at times, yes, it has felt like a burden to me. And at times it's been like, you know, I have credibility in certain places. And at times it's just like, this is a really cool name. And it has different syncretic elements in the name. I mean, that was purposeful. My parents didn't give us Muslim names. They gave us Sanskritic names that could be, you know, a kind of a hat tip to their modernity and their desire to have syncretism in our names. So I think for me, it's like Thanwin and Dini Islam are names that kind of go together. And the people, like this guy today was like, oh, for marketing purposes, you should really drop your name. And then I was like, I'm good, thanks. Like, I'll be okay. <laughs> and then he was like, well, you could play it up like Charles Manson or Marilyn, Ma you know, Marilyn Manson did with Charles Manson's name. I was like, really not the same thing. No. So it's like violently offensive. Um, <laughs> but I think, but you know, as, you know, things go, racism and things, you know, you're, we're really Im not immune well, to it. I'm not immune to it. I mean, it got to me, but I was like, no, this is, I'm off to Gracie Mansion. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> Have fun tonight. Like, <laughs> like I'll see you at the mansion. So it's I'm kind of like whatever. You can talk all you want, but I'm okay. Like things are all, things yeah. are gonna be okay. I had a I had a <laughs> joke with some friends of mine that I was gonna turn my name backwards because it sounds too much like an Irish guy. <laughs> um, I was gonna be Samaj Mahana, <laughs> and then no one would question whether or not I was black. <laughs> I would here. read a book by Samaj Mahan. I know. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do it. I, I, I mean, <laughs> um, and there, are, there, are, these young women, women in the book are exploring a lot of different aspects of sex and sexuality, but their reaction is is unexpected a lot of the time. Um, they don't label themselves, I notice, and they don't 
they don't start to, to use that label to seek out like community, for lack of a better term. Um, why did you decide to handle the material that way? Well, I think that's part of language is that very academic or activist language can sometimes not be so suited to literary fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so gender nonconforming or terms that are like more accurate might not have this um, vibe or feeling that I'm going for in fiction. So one example in the novel is this word swadin, which means ultimate liberation. And in Sanskrit, that has many different meanings. I mean, it, it's a name that you know, someone who is born female but lives as a man might take. And it's also a word that means liberation in the context of a war. And I felt like that was so poetic and beautiful. Like there's a war story here and then there's a self-discovery story here. Like let me use that word that doesn't exist in English. Um, and in another way, I think it's very now. Like young people are bending gender in this awesome way. And I feel like this book might be 10 years ago, but that's very now. Like to have young people just being like, I'm not a gender, like I'm a person and I'm my name and I'm this being that can choose who I am. And I really wanted to kind of imbue the book with that energy um, because I think it's liberating in a lot of ways to almost be beyond certain things that, you know, yeah. identities. I, and I mean, I feel like it, it creates a much, uh, a really internal sense of what's going on in the character and there's not, you know, a feeling that, there's a prepackaged way to think about it and that they may have mixed feelings about it themselves like in their heads even if they did decide you know later to become you know activists for lgbtqi um rights um i mean it's also just like language is not something that everyone has access to like th when you're in high school you might be very conscious but that's an assumption that I didn't want to make about these characters and i think there's this moment where ella is debating like what is it like to be in like the straight gay alliance? Um, oh, do we have a Twitter question? Oh. Uh, no, not yet. Sorry, okay. <laughs> oh. I need to be asking you questions. Oh, okay, from the audience. <laughs> 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 and, then the, and then the audience. <laughs> then the audience. Uh, but, you know, just debating like, what it, does the term lesbian feel real to me? And mm -hmm. that word, even for people who have relationships with women who have relationships with women, the word lesbian might not even be the term that they want to use. So I think it's very much an assumption to think like, oh, I know GLBT sounds for this, this, and this, and this, but it's like, those words might not even be relevant to the people that, you know, yeah. you're, you're talking about. So I wanted my characters to have their self-determination at the forefront of how they want to talk about themselves. I keep waiting for so many of those letters to be added that it, that it just means people. Yeah. It just means yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when you read this book, Charlene, um, can you, what, what were your first impressions of it? Because it was my choice, and I knew it was going to you, and, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know, it might be a little out there. <laughs> it's Brooklyn! I, <laughs> I loved it. It really, you know, I, I moved to New York in 1977. And I lived in Brooklyn in the early 80s. And to me, that was, I know it was, you wrote during a, a later time period, but for me, that was like, that was the Brooklyn I knew. That was the Brooklyn, you know, where I go to Atlantic Avenue and buy couscous and it had that vibrancy and life. And, and it just, and you know, people um, would ride bicycles around. I rode my bicycle around and it just really, brought back a whole era for me of when I was in my 20s and mm -hmm. and free and <laughs> 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 exploring New York and I I really I love that and I love um, the three girls I, I was so fascinated with all three of them and and how they interacted and how they related to one another I thought it was just a just a really fascinating exploration, um, the way they accepted each other's differences, but um, had their own journeys that, to, that they had to go on. Mm -hmm. um, was there a favorite character? I mean, I know the three girls you just mentioned, but. Yeah, it, you know, I thought long and hard about that, and I don't think I had a favorite character. I liked the three girls, and I liked Anwar, too. 
and I wanted to hear more about Hashi. I was. I know. Yeah, right? I know. Because so, <laughs> well, there, there, was, there was more life there uh, for me. There was more life to be explored. But those three girls, and, and Maya, of course, they don't, we don't get to know as well. But i like, what is her story? Living with this devout father and the mother who's so sick. And how is she managing her inner life? You know, and, and take the hijab, taking it off, putting it on. I mean, what is going through her mind? I, I had so many questions as I was reading the book. This made me think about how people navigate, um, again, identity and deciding, like, what they're going to keep and what they're going to leave behind and w when they're coming from a, a family like that. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, Maya is one of the characters that I think she is a mystery kind mm -hmm. of throughout the book, and I wanted it to be like, what is her story? You know, what is her story? Where is she headed? And so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah it, it seemed to me like she was the echo of a more typical kind of conflict mm -hmm. uh, between uh, the children of immigrants. And, but I liked that, that she was, that it was there, but it wasn't the f necessarily the, the center of the story mm -hmm. because um, it, it was really, it was a dramatic, um, it was a dramatic thing to do, it, but it was kind of placed perfectly mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the context of the rest of the, the book. It's very much about the diaspora, right? So there's the South Asian diaspora, but there's also this Muslim diaspora, and she's coming from another part of the Muslim diaspora, and mm -hmm. it's different from what Charu and Ella are experiencing, but they have this commonality of religion, but that even doesn't fit Right. You know, what I mean, it's really hard to it. it's really hard to imagine Charu being the the daughter being Maya, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> it's that sounds like it would be just a, a giant fight. Yeah, all the time. But <laughs> it's like the, the chicken and the egg. Like, would she even be like that if she had those her you know different parents? Right. And and I think all of us are like that. It's like, am I who I am because my parents were like this, or you know, was I just like this and my parents became the way they were because I was born? <laughs> You know, my destiny was to be a jerk, and like they, <laughs> they went with that, you know. So I, I think that's kind of the thing that she also illuminates is that her existence as a Muslim young woman is very different from Charu um, and Ella. And this is like right after 9 11, so even their consciousness of being Muslim, I think, is more heightened uh -huh. than had this book been 10 years prior to that. Right. It's not really mentioned, but it is. No, like there's one sentence. <laughs> And S and Suki, yeah. I think I think for me, um, Maya was a character that I saw a lot of myself in a lot of, lot of the search for identity, um, the search for understanding, uh, the search for belonging, and I think that's like a commonality that's thread. Like you know, tr everybody learning to understand who they were, the inner conflict, and I was just thinking like myself as an immigrant coming here as a young person. Sometimes I felt like I was living through my parents' life, their optics of what it is to be Indian, their optics of what they thought I should be like and who I should be and how I should represent myself, how I should, how I should be, my religion. Um, and it took me a minute to actually find my own voice and create that for myself. So for me, Bright Lines is more of the struggle for first-generation immigrants living here in America, especially new immigrants. Um, I was telling her I grew up on Staten Island predominantly, uh, Irish, Italian, and so much of me is also Irish and Italian. I might not look it, but I make a great sauce. Um, <laughs> and I can, you know, I could drink with the best of them and dance a great jig, too. Um, but um, a, We might ask you. Oh, no, no. Yeah, you're, putting, you're setting yourself <laughs> no, no, up, Suki. No, but... <laughs> But I, 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 think, I think a part of that is just, you know, in the 70s and 80s, I mean, there was, I mean, Queens, what it is today, the temples that are there, the mosques that are there, the names, being able to carry your name, I so feel that. Because the name I was given at times felt like a burden. Having to explain what is Sukanya Krishnan. I mean, that is a daunting thing to ask a child. What is your name? Who are you? I mean, my friends never got those questions asked of them. Who are you? That is a strange question to ask anybody. They didn't, they didn't ask, what are you? Well, I got a what are you, too, you know? Mm. Um, and I always got a what are you. But for me, 
I never, you know, Suki is a name of affection. Um, and when I was doing media, God bless media, God bless all of it. Um, but in the 90s, when you're breaking into it, there, I, I didn't fit a parameter. I mean, they were like, who, well, uh, and I was like, hello, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. I grew up on Staten Island. I should be on TV in New York City. It only <laughs> makes sense. Hello, I mean, I would tell news director job after job after job, but it was almost like I had to fit into a parameter. And that's where I find the character so identifiable because there is no one parameter and they are redefining themselves even though they are defined like Anwar is by his past. And sometimes I felt defined by my parents in how they wanted to put me in the box that they thought that I belonged. But I continue to redefine what it is to be me. Um, and I hope my next generation, which is the second generation, my children, will be able to redefine it for themselves and they will never have to explain what they are or who they are and what does your name stand for. Because they'll it's be the from New York. That's right, and we'll, you know what we'll do? We take the bats out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, kn I'm, I know, I'm from Yonkers. <laughs> but you know what I mean? I mean, it's, that's the crisis and the struggle that I think that your book blends about our journey as new immigrants, which I am so grateful for because I think that is not documented enough. Because being, having one foot in one country and having another foot in another country and balancing it and creating your voice for yourself is so hard to do. And I just think I'm everything that created me to this point. I am my neighbors to uh, the Italian side of me, my friends who were Jamaican and uh, Indo-Caribbean. Uh, I am all of that wound up in one because that is what is to wear that coat that is being a New Yorker. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we. I, I think, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Why don't we uh, open it up to audience uh, questions? Um, there's somebody who's going to come around with a microphone. Oh. oh. Like everyone in this room, and I think it is true, we said, who's going to be here tonight? And I think everybody felt that. I was talking about that online. What I find so interesting, and I thought, I mean, it's a, it's a diverse, not as far as gender goes, because men don't read <laughs> books. That's the book club but thing. Uh, the, but there's nobody with a head covering. Are Muslim women reading your book? Are they aware of you? I mean, you know, I find that I can't connect with Muslim women really makes me sad because uh, wh where are they? I mean, with the Islamophobia th the way it is, that, that we can't connect. Uh, where are they? Well, Muslim women are everywhere. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister's here, too. Um, but besides that point, um, that was a joke. Uh, but I think visibility and being in a space and wearing a hijab or not wearing a hijab, I mean, these are all very personal endeavors. And I think the trick is not to kind of be like, where are all these people at? Um, because it is so much about the interpersonal connection and feeling like there's, you know, friendship or some sort of way that you connect to another person. Um, I have had a lot of Muslim women read my book that I know of, and hopefully many more, and maybe some of you in this room, I don't know everyone's religion in here. But I think that the, the point is, is, when you have a book like this, it does create a conversation um, where is this representing me? Does this not represent me? Is this some, it's, it's very different for all of us. So even if I'm saying I'm a Muslim woman, I am a Muslim woman who's not covering my head and I'm not praying five times a day and I'm this different sort of Muslim woman. But I think that there's this idea of clumping everyone together um, that I think can be a little bit tricky and dangerous if we do it in a way. So. Hopefully, you know, when we open our eyes and we see someone, maybe they're wearing a hijab, I think that, like, making, initiating that contact, making that effort to, like, talk to them or engage with them in whatever space you're in does actually go a long way. Um, but I also don't think that it's something to point at someone and be like, you look like X, Y, and Z, so I want to know who your community is. I don't think it works that way. I, um, I think instead of just asking 
you know, where are the Muslim women? You should ask yourself, where am I yeah, that I'm exactly. not meeting Muslim women? Yeah, yeah. And this happens a lot, actually. Um, I was talking about this with a friend who's like, well, I just don't know a lot of people of color because I don't work with them and my partners, wh you know, we're both white. And, and it's like, well, most of my friends are people of color and I don't know why that's even the case. So, you know, and they're not just South Asian, Muslim, Bangladeshi people of color. They're all types of people and white people. Um, so I think that is something where we are really, you know, making that effort to open up our community, it's, it's on us to do that. Mm -hmm. Another? Um, is the uh, women in, in maroon? Burgundy. Burgundy, <laughs> Burgundy. I, couldn't, I couldn't describe <laughs> the outfit. Hi. Hi, my name is Jaina Bafai, and uh, I really, gosh, I'm gonna get emotional. Aww. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am an African woman, and I'm from the Gambia. <laughs> and I am a Muslim woman. And, you know, according to mainstream media, I don't even exist. Mm -hmm. Because people's idea of Muslim women is um, an Arab woman or an Indian woman. Mm -hmm. And it can be so stressful to not see yourself represented anywhere. But I really enjoyed the story because I saw so much of myself my cousins, especially Maya, I had a cousin who used to take the hijab off <laughs> <laughs> on the school bus and then come home and, you know, pretend. And I remember, you know, going to middle school and wanting to wear the hijab, but I chickened out mm -hmm. <laughs> before the first day of school because so much of growing up is just wanting to be accepted mm -hmm. and wanting to be what's considered normal. And it's so difficult as an immigrant child to not disappoint your parents, your family, your heritage, because you still love those parts of yourself, but also finding that middle ground in that duality of being an American child as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like she's saying, she's a part of that Irish <laughs> community, it, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it can just be such a journey, but it's so important to, you know, make sure also that we don't owe anyone our stories either. Mm -hmm. And so if you mm -hmm. do see a Muslim woman or someone who's different from you, I don't think you should approach them and expect them to give you this, Absolutely. you know, beautiful narrative. We don't owe anyone that. There's, you know, there are so many ways to find that, you know, outside of just walking up to strangers and trying to find their story. And then that single story also doesn't represent everyone. Absolutely. And I think that's something we really need to change. This was not a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, just to thank you so much for that. And I actually get really emotional too when I think about like the little me and the person, the, you know, this beautiful, well-spoken woman that you are, but how much you've been through to just be who you are and to just live in the world and not be killed, not be beaten, not be hurt, not be violated, not, you know, just to be here. Um, it's work. And like, it is so like awesome that you're here. Thank you for being here with me. But just to hear that makes me feel so good. Because again, it's like, you know, connecting to what you're asking. I mean, we're everywhere. It's just how much you open your eyes to look. But again, your story is sacred and you don't have to, you don't owe that to anyone. Yeah. You just are living and you're here and that's awesome, so thank you. I just think like also what you're saying, um, as a South Asian too, I always, when I grew up, everybody would be like, put on a sari was like a costume on Halloween. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it would really, I mean, yeah. And it would, it would like offend me growing up because it wasn't a costume that my mother put on or my grandmother put on. The bindi wasn't, you know, something that she decided to, you know, it makes me emotional too because that's the hurt that you carry as a child, you know? And that is so palatable as this 45 year old woman sitting in front of you. It's like you can just go there in an instant because you were that kid on the playground whose grandmother would cook a tiffin, you know, which is so cool now to have like a little tiffin box. <laughs> but when I was growing up, those tiffin boxes were not cool. You were not cool. You know, eating biryani in a playground was not cool. Um, you wanted that tuna fish sandwich. Why, I don't know. Um, why, I don't know. Bologna sandwich, why, I don't know. Um, but I would have liked <laughs> But, I mean, but I, I just think it's part of the understanding and the education of new immigrants, you know? This is who we are, 
Um, our customs are different, but they are what it is to be New York. Um, we are all part of that oneness of this universe, of this humanity, of this world that we're living. And, you know, we have to break down those stereotypes for our children. Um, and it is our duty and our obligation as adults to stand on that conviction alone to be able to tell our children when you look at somebody that is not a costume, that is their culture, that is their tradition, and it is time that we learn about it because we are not going anywhere. It's also a great reminder of why we're writing fiction, right? Um, there's some lady in, uh, with the red hair back there. Me? Yes, you. Hi. Hi, I have just two questions. Okay. Uh, is there going to be a sequel? Ooh. <laughs> Want those hundred pages? <laughs> and um, do you see this book made a movie? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the two favorite questions that I think about all the time. Um, <laughs> so first question, I have 150 pages that happened 10 years later of the events in this book, so you guys let me know if you want a sequel. Uh -huh. My publisher is here. Um, that's a joke. We'll talk about it I want a sitcom. <laughs> I, I want a sitcom, actually. A sitcom, right? <laughs> uh, just like a th loft with three bedrooms. Or fresh off the boat. Fresh off the boat. <laughs> Uh, and then the it's movie so thing, I mean, stuff. technically, you know, someone has to option your book and all this stuff. So, you know, I'm open to anything. <laughs> I can see it as a movie. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if Hollywood can, but. No. Well, maybe Bollywood. Bollywood. <laughs> oh, over here. I've been neglecting this side of the room. I'm sorry. Hi, this uh, question is for Dani. Um, so I'm Bangladeshi Muslim myself. So I have a question from about audiences, per, specifically the Bangladeshi community. Um, here in the US, or if you think back home in Bangladesh, what do you think or what kind of feedback have you gotten? And would you be able to do something like this in Bangladesh where you discuss your book? Because I know there's a lot of content in here that is very sensitive. <sighs> okay, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so my Number one thing is like, I was really afraid for my parents to read it, but my mom loved it, so we're good. That was like, she was my number one Bangladeshi Muslim that I was concerned with, so she was like, I loved it, feeling awesome. That was her text, she didn't even call me, she just like texted me and was like, yeah, like sent me like her a bitmoji and was like, this is great. And I was like, okay, where are we right now? This is, I thought we would have tears and dinner, whatever. So that was number one. She loved it. And her friends who've read it loved it. So that says to me that there is this like progressive, wonderful openness that women of their generation and our generation have. But I've also gotten feedback that's much more like conservative. That's like, this is too sexual. There's too much aggressive sexuality in this book. Um, and I understand where they're coming from as well. In terms of can I do this event in Bangladesh, well, I mean, as many of you know what's going on, you know, people are being murdered right now for espousing beliefs that are not Muslim beliefs. Um, so recently an editor of, uh, you know, LGBTQ magazine was butchered. And it's very close to home. I mean, he's a friend of a friend. And this is someone that, like, you know, if you're an artist, I mean, the world is not full of artists, right? So these are people, like, if we were going to Bangladesh, we would want to kick it with and get a drink with and talk to and, and talk about life with. And to see that someone who's doing such important work is being slaughtered and no one is really saying that they're mad about it and the government's not really going after I think someone was arrested, but there, it's not... You know, there's not outrage in the way that I would feel safe sharing this kind of work um, in that space. So right now I'm taking a break from Bangladesh and visiting and going there. And a lot of artists that I'm friends with, who I'm friends with, are also taking a little bit of a break to see how this situation pans out. Because it's not just people who are queer or, you know, people who are not Muslim. I mean, it's people that are Hindu or a Buddhist monk or all these people that are different. And this fear of difference is so violent right now that I think for me this might not be at the time to share it. Um, so I'm, I'm very aware of how it affects different, you know, p 
people that I'm connected to. Well, perhaps it'll be translated and you can be banned. <coughs> and, and that will I'm like, that please will don't translate. More, that'll create more interest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, but you'll have to hire a security detail. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the, p the pink? And I don't know how much more time we have left, but we're okay? Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Angela, and my question for you is the following. Um, there's so much that happens in the book, and we get so many different perspectives um, across generation, across gender, across um, sexuality, and we um, come across characters that overcome a lot of struggles and come, um, they come to terms with things in their own way. And because there's so much that happens, I'm just curious, um, given all of that, what do you want the audience to walk away with? Um, is there something that stands out for you that you would want us to know or walk away with lessons or um, a, change of, a change in perspective, whatever that may be? That's a great question. I think I would love for my readers to walk away, number one, with a more nuanced understanding of just people, you know, and then again, like we're saying, like this tendency that we all have to put people into identity boxes. I mean, Bangladeshi, Muslim, female, that, you know, yes, they are all of those things. Yes, we are all of those things, but we are so much more. And there is the role and the hand of history in our life. There is the desire for a future that we cannot know until we're in it. There is the tragedies that will befall us that we cannot predict. I mean, these are all things shaping human beings. And I really want the reader by the very last line to have this sense of like so much has been lost and there's so much yet to come, you know? And I think that is really the heart of this book is like there is, there is more to come for these young people, you know, as much as they've lost, as much, there's, it ends on a note of hope, and I always say this, is realism is a very deadly place for people of color and queer people, and, and realism does not allow us to actually live, and I wanted to write a book in which realism was a place where young people could be hopeful, and we can see a future, a sequel, as she would say, um, <laughs> but we could see that these, kids are going to be okay, you know? Like, I, I really wanted to end on that that note. Um, the lady back here. Hi, thank you, First Lady, for inviting us here, and thank you, Ms. Lazon, for your book. I just wanted to ask, um, one of my favorite characters was Ella, and I just wanted to ask, her transition to Elle was so kind of smooth in a way, so I just <laughs> wanted you to um, elaborate on that, why you chose to make it um, such a seemingly smooth transition from Ella to L. Thank you for asking that because <laughs> I feel like spoiler? I've been no. Okay. Well, if you've read it, it's not. Oh, if it's okay. if you haven't read it, yes, it's a spoiler. But oh, read it anyway. Read it anyway. Um, but that's a great question. I've actually wanted to answer that question, <laughs> but no one's asked that before. Uh, so this is a question of subtlety. You know, like do you take the route of uh, being subtle about a gender transition or or even talking about sexuality, or do you say forcefully, hey guys, this is who I am, this is who I always have been, and it's a conversation. What I wanted to do in this instance is take the character, they're no longer in Brooklyn where they're very much defined, and now they're in Bangladesh where they're not so defined. And again, masculinity and things that we take for granted in terms of how we see people is not the same in different contexts. So being read as male and being someone who is not seen the way that they are seen in Brooklyn was such an amazing opportunity to let Elle just live in the shoes of the person that they have always wanted to be and were meant to be and connect to the, you know, the father figure that Elle never had. And Anwar is a father figure, but not like Rezwan, who's like very much a regal soldier, like masculine father figure. Um, very much a fantasy, you know, for Elle. So it's kind of like finding that character's true self happened in another place away from home, just like finding my book happened in another place away from home. So I think that's kind of where the subtlety came from. And again, that word swadin that I discussed earlier, I was like, I have to find a way to use this amazing word. And it came out through this process and journey of Elle kind of shedding the name Ella and becoming Elle, but it's also really telling that that's the 
the name that Charu is always called El, and it's very poetic almost. It's like the person that I love the most is the one who's seeing me in my truest way. So I felt like those were all things that I wanted you as a reader to walk away with instead of me telling you that this is happening and this is the changes that are, you know, they're going through and it's a, it's a political, you know, it's, m everything is political. I I'm not saying it's not political, but it's not my politics imposed on you. It is like an organic shift in this person's understanding of who they are. And I, I wanted to do that in a very quiet way. Because they're quiet. Ella's quiet, you know? That's, that's their smooth style, so. All right, we have time for one more. Oh, you've had your hand up. You've had your hand up for a little while, I think. So, um, so just a question specifically. Oh, specifically about the book. Um, I love the Anwar character. He's my favorite. I found him the, the guiding post of the book, the, the golden thread. I, I found him heroic, and I really have to ask you why you killed him off. Oh. <laughs> no, no, seriously, because. Oh, no. Because this is like, no, no, these no. are the questions you don't, you're no, like no, scared no, of. That, without him, I, I felt that the book. That, that didn't been. happen in my edition. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm I just, mean, I'm without him, where does, where does the book go next? I mean, he was, his, his love for everybody, different love for everybody was so outstanding. And he told, the, he's the one who told the history, so. All right, since we're in the spoiler sessions All right. now. okay. Um, I love that you felt so much about him like that's awesome that you felt him so hard that you were like how could you do this to me <laughs> like, turning the book over and you're like this horrible person so i'm like i love that um but i i honestly like that symbolic loss of this really um, i loved writing him so i mean i think you can feel the love that i have for him like i freaking love anwar and he's probably the one I do feel this real connection to in a, in a way, because he's the first one I created in this world. But this death, I mean, it has so much to do with that moment that he's so in love with his wife after all this stuff has gone wrong. He's so in love with his wife, and he's holding her gifts for people, and, they're, and, and then there's this image that I had of a cow, and I was thinking, like, how can we take these two kind of symbols of this very, you know, intense holiday where people have, like, are celebrating their, you know, it's a religious holiday. How can I kind of have this moment happen where he is sharing the most intimate moment he's ever had in his life? And I could not think of anything more intimate than sharing death in that, in that moment. Is that everything that they've lived through and been through, it felt like that moment was right. Now, the aftermath is like, where do you go after that? I really wanted the girls to kind of have their life and to go forward and to rise up and, and be the inheritors of his, his life. I mean, they have inherited everything that he's given them. So Ella has the house and the trees and nature and botany, and Charu has his passion and his kind of, you know, upside down way of doing things. And like, he, really, they have become who he was and who Hashi was. So I think in fiction, that's where, you know, you do strike the reader in the gut and then you allow things to kind of be illuminated through that. And the letter is a way for you to go back to him and hear him, but he really feels dead because it's a letter. And as great as letters are, they're pretty, I mean, it's not the <laughs> same as the real person. So that's my, yeah, it's like my little explanation. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I cried too, if that's any consolation. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it, people don't really read for events. They read for process, so. Yeah, and people write for process. Don't too. worry about yeah. knowing that now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm afraid that is all we have time for Thank today. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. everybody, for being on this panel. Um, I, 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 I made a Don terrible error up front. And I want to, just before you wind up, which is especially for those um, visiting us uh, uh, in the virtual community, is to honor the other authors. So as we look forward uh, to the s series continuing, and now with all of you as members, I wanted to salute uh, Naomi Jackson, who's the author Woo! of the next book. Yes! Um, that, um, uh, which is a, um, a wonderful book. Uh, 
and with James as moderator. A.M. Holmes, a wonderful writer, who is the next um, moderator. And uh, the very, uh, very fabled, uh, she's won so many Newberries she can't count, uh, Jacqueline Woodson, who, uh, <coughs> uh, who is going to be uh, the, the, is the curator and moderator along with uh, the first lady of the Young uh, Readers series this summer. So uh, forgive me. I, and finally, just Tracy K. Smith, the poet who's on our board of advisors, who has been guiding us and who brought, uh, led us to, to so many uh, of you, and we're grateful to her. So I'm, I apologize for that. John. Tony is, Tony is going to be signing books in the blue room uh, to your, well, it's to, to your back left <laughs> uh, pretty much immediately. Thanks again for coming out and have a good night. Oh.